Yeah, hey, Luigi. What? What? They need help. Both places? Okay, well, you can ask him. All right. December 14th, 1940. British land forces have seen scattered action so far this war in places like France, Norway, and Somaliland, and these were for the most part defensive. In fact, Britain has not mounted a major land offensive so far. Until this week. This week, Britain attacks. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Greek counteroffensive against the Italians continued gaining ground, moving up the Albanian coast. Adolf Hitler met with his command to make more concrete plans for an invasion of the USSR, and his next attempt to get Spain to join the war stalls. That was part of a plan called Operation Felix to take Gibraltar. And that operation is shelved for good now on the 10th after Abwehr chief Wilhelm Canaris cables Hitler about it. The Abwehr is the German military intelligence service. Today, though, I'm going to talk about another intelligence service for a minute, British Signals Intelligence. We were sent a declassified RAF report by Paul Dabrova, thank you, Paul, analyzing just how much contribution British Signals Intel contributed to winning the Battle of Britain as compared to, say, radar. The majority of the conclusions, though by no means all, are that while radar contributed very much on a tactical level, on a strategic level, signals intelligence played a big part, though neither was the deciding factor. Well, that discussion is still in the future. What I'm going to talk about now is some interesting stuff I found out about R.V. Jones, the head of British scientific intelligence at just 29 years old. He has been concerned with Germany's scientific capability as it has grown and evolved and how Britain could counter new German weapons as they emerged. It was he who figured out how to read the German navigational beam systems that direct Luftwaffe bombers. There have been two main German radio beam navigational systems used during the Battle of Britain, Knickbein and Ex Gerat. Knickbein was discovered in March 1940 from notes found in a downed bomber. This system was a main beam, which the plane followed to the target via a Lawrence receiver, and an intercepting beam to designate bomb release point. At about the same time, a German POW told about Ex Gerät, which is more sophisticated. This system has four intersecting beams that guide the plane, determine its speed of approach, and automatically release the bombs. Well, Jones had the basic information, and he set out to reverse engineer how it all worked. In June 1940, intelligence managed to locate the Knickbein transmitter at Kleve, and from there, he could prove his theories. He did get plenty of further information from downed planes, POWs, and the like, and signals intelligence was soon able to provide some advance warning of Knickbein and ex targets so fighter command could take effective countermeasures. Jones claimed his system usually provided two to three hours of advance warning of Luftwaffe targets. Fighter interception, though, was ineffective at night. So Jones worked on either jamming or distorting the radio beams to confuse German pilots and ruin their accuracy. This is from that report. Substantial progress was not made in the development of integrated fighter intercept and electronic countermeasure techniques until late October. So not until around the end of daytime bombing missions. However, sufficient progress had been made during the course of the battle to create a general mistrust among the Luftwaffe air crews as to the reliability of these systems. And that is important. The Germans did not fully trust their navigational systems. That was what R.V. Jones brought to the table. I just thought that was, you know, quite interesting and deserved mention. Also interesting that, as if we needed more corroboration, he notes the Coventry attack was not mentioned in Enigma messages. And to any argument as to whether or not Coventry might have been forewarned, I knew nothing of it. One other thing British intelligence has done, several weeks ago as we saw, is crack the Italian army's ciphers in Africa. Now, Italian forces have occupied a strip of Egypt since mid-September, the desert coastline from Solom to Sidi Barani. By now in Cairo, British cryptographers have broken all the Italian codes used for formations all the way down to brigade level for both tactics and intelligence. They know exactly where the Italian forces are, 
where they are stronger and where they are weaker. And the British offensive in Africa, Operation Compass, begins December 9th. General Richard O'Connor, the field commander, leads the 7th Armored and 4th Indian Divisions, supported by the 7th Royal Tank Regiment in the attack. Archibald Wavell is in overall command. The British have fairly limited objectives at first because they have fairly limited reserves. Rodolfo Graziani is in overall Italian command with seven divisions of the 10th Army deployed in forward positions. O'Connor's two divisions advance from Mersa Matru over 100 kilometers away, beginning the 6th, and they achieve total surprise. The British units move forward with 225 tanks and 150 big guns backed by the Royal Navy off the coast and the RAF hitting the Italian airfields. The British attack is essentially a left hook around the coastal positions. The Italians, with tankettes and M1139 medium tanks, do not really have an answer to the Matilda tank, and two Italian camps fall to the Matildas this day, those tanks being impervious to an assortment of Italian artillery. Troops of the 4th Indian Division take City Barani by day's end the 10th. 20,000 prisoners are taken this day. Part of the 7th Armored, attacking northwest, cuts off the coast road between City Barani and Bukbuk, the Italian retreat road, while the main force engages the Cantanzaro Division near Bukbuk. Four Italian divisions surrender the 11th. Book Book falls, and the Cantanzaro division is destroyed. The Cyrene division manages to escape, though, by falling back to the Halfaya Pass to join other Italian forces there. On the 11th, Admiral Cunningham's Mediterranean fleet bombards Sulum. 14,000 more prisoners are taken this day. In three days, 38,000 Italians are captured for the loss of 624 British and Indians killed or wounded. 73 Italian tanks have also been captured, and the Italians have been pushed almost entirely out of Egypt, except Sidi Omar and the approaches to Salem. On the 13th, a small British force enters Libya and cuts the road leading west to Bardia, an important Italian position. By this time, though, the 4th Armored Division and 7th Armored Brigade, trying to pursue the retreating Italians, are not only having supply problems, but also logistic problems since the British have taken 20 times the number of prisoners they prepared for. Still, the week comes to an end even as the advance continues. The 4th Indian Division, though, minus one brigade, is called to East Africa and will be replaced by the 6th Australian Division. But though the Italians are on the run in North Africa, their retreat from Greece and the Greek army is really slowing down this week. Sure, the Greeks in the TSDM, the Western Macedonia sector, capture Ostrovitsa Mountain the 12th, but that's basically it for the actual advances and captures this week. However, from the 10th, Germany will transfer the 10th Flieger Corps to southern Italy and Sicily to assist in the whole Mediterranean region. And on the 13th, Adolf Hitler issues Führer Directive No. 20, the plans for Operation Marita. This will increase forces in southern Romania over the next few months and then strike at Greece through Bulgaria. 24 divisions are planned for the operation, which also has provisions to possibly take the Greek islands as well. But Hitler also issues Directive No. 19 on the 10th, the day the Gibraltar plan is shelved, which calls for Operation Attila, the eventual occupation of Vichy, France, to control French airfields near the Mediterranean and the naval base at Toulon. Martin Gilbert has this to say of those two directives. The war, which six months earlier seemed confined to Northern Europe, had now spread entirely as a result of Italy's unsuccessful initiatives to the Mediterranean. I should point out that the text of Directive Number 19 specifically says to not tell the Italians, and that of Number 20 says any notification of the Italians and how far Marita will be supported by them is reserved for future decisions. Hitler is not the only one giving directives and orders this week, though. On December 9th, Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the Chinese Nationalist Army, gives some interesting orders of his own. By December 31st, he wants the Communist New Fourth Army to be entirely north of the Yangtze River. And by January 31st, the New Fourth Army and the Communist Eighth Root Army to be north of the Yellow River. Communist forces have been south of the Yellow River and to a certain extent south of the Yangtze for like half a year now. And there have been skirmishes, as we've seen, 
between them and Chang's nationalists, even though they're both at war with the invading Japanese. Well, Chang is pretty clear in a message to General Gu Zhutong that if they do not move by the deadline, then you must take care of this matter, no more tolerance. Speaking of skirmishes, I mentioned in October that they had begun along the Thai border with French Indochina between Thai and Vichy forces. Thai Prime Minister Playek Pibul Songram thought he could regain territory in Laos and Cambodia lost to France decades ago. Well, those skirmishes have continued, and it looks like things might get even more serious. This week on the 9th, French Admiral Jean Dicou forms the small naval squadron called Groupe Occasionnel near Saigon in French Indochina, just in case any offensive actions the Thai Navy might take. This force is made up of a light cruiser and four avisos. An aviso is a French medium warship used in colonial service. These ships are supported by several small coastal survey craft and seaplanes for reconnaissance. I do have one more political note this week. On the 13th in Vichy, France, its leader, Philippe Pétain, asks his cabinet to sign a collective letter of resignation. Pierre Laval, who has several roles in the Pétain government, including foreign minister and vice president, thinks this is a scheme to get rid of the minister of labor, René Bellin. He is thus quite surprised to find his resignation accepted and himself arrested that evening. He is soon freed from prison when the German ambassador intervenes. He is out of the government. He has been more and more at odds with Pétain lately, especially after making decisions like turning over the Belgian gold reserves to the Germans without consulting his colleagues. He openly sympathizes with Nazi Germany and, as we saw, was a main architect of ending French democracy. And that note will end the week, a week of small Greek gains, but enormous British ones and orders from Germany and China. Britain has scored a big victory this week and one the British public could sure use. It's been six months since we saw advances like this, the Germans in Western Europe. What does this mean? It means that all Italian positions in Africa are suddenly in danger. And judging from the German response to Greece, it means Germany may well send troops to Africa too. And what those two happenings would mean is that there will be a lot more fighting. And what that means is that thousands and thousands more people, this time in Southeastern Europe and Africa, will die violent and bloody deaths. Now, this is not the first time that Field Marshal Graziani has had military problems in Libya. If you want to see how he and Italy fought over control for Libya in 1931, you can check out our Between Two Wars episode on that right here. Coming any moment now. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Becky Romero. It's because of patrons like Becky that our show is well supplied in a way that the armies of North Africa in 1940 were not. So please join us at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. We need you. Make sure to subscribe, click that bell. See you next time. Mm -hmm.